Welcome back to the VR Lab. We're just having a little casual discussion today, and Nick will explain why. Thanks, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> a lot sooner than I was expecting. So in the previous video, we I kind of described the use of video as something beyond evidence or evidence-based. For instance, what does it evoke for the user? What does it really mean to see through the perspective, through someone's eyes? And we're not just talking about the practicalities of a camera view, but actually the emotional effect that this view has. Imagery is understood to both reveal and conceal information. It isn't a point of pure evidence base. Instead, it suggests what might be or what might become. And that's the thing about film theory. It's a suggestion to the audience of how something might be. And if we treat video as an evident, then we are losing the plot altogether because video is all about reflection. Shortly after our video went online, we had a comment from Old Fangled who asked, are you applying that theory idea for video reflection as opposed to as evidence in the context of educational use, particularly with setup slash acted out POV videos? And now we'll attempt to unpack the differences between video as reflective and video as evidence. Imagery and video is used as evidence. You see that in journalism quite, quite frequently. It may not be the complete evidence, however, we see that used and we certainly see it in documentary as well. What I'm alluding to actually is the use of video, particularly kind of point of view video and imagery in healthcare in a way that it functions as something more than evidence. And so what I was meaning was that we can't rely on imagery just as the evidence. Actually, what does imagery suggest? What is this you know, power of suggestion and reflection? And so I thought to clarify, we'd open that up for a bit of discussion here in the group. And we have Jackie here as well. And Jackie is part of the team, a uh, recent member of the team, and brings a wealth of uh, experience from film and photography and imagery. And that's why this would be quite an interesting discussion, I feel. Hello, Jackie. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jackie, uh, this idea of imagery beyond evidence, so this, you explain it as well, imagery has this power to conceal, it has this power to reveal, and a lot of that is up for interpretation, particularly when you're filming from various perspectives, as a lot of the work I do is perspective-based, which is extremely powerful, but there comes about um, a point where the filmmaker has to really think carefully about the, the kind of the emotion that they're trying to, uh, you know, create with the audience. Um, and to me, that felt like there was there was more depth required to understand that kind of aspect of filmmaking. What's your experiences of mm. I using imagery and video and, and, and film actually for, I guess, reflection and? Okay. Well, um, I guess I come from an experimental photography and, um, and filmmaking background. Um, so using lens-based media, um, I'm very aware uh, that you're only capturing a partial story of any event um, because obviously you're putting a frame on that thing mm -hmm. and, the f and the camera is generally held with you or within proximity. Um, so giving first person points of view um, will always only be a partial story, a partial history mm -hmm. later on um, and a partial perspective. So um, in that way, we know that also, and I mean, in lots of other ways, um, the camera can distort and it can create a lag. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lag involved. Um, uh, there's also lots of other kind of manipulations and things that can kind of happen in, in between. Um, also certain gestures can look a certain way but actually be a completely different gesture in reality because mm. you're only privileged to a kind of um, a, 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 a one a one sixtieth of a second yeah. uh, moment in which you generally do not see the before and the after moment so there's lots of ways in which photography and film conceals truth and reveals truth at mm. the same time mm. um, so this is why we say that they do not, they're, they're less um, evidential, but more a, a reassurance. Um, so generally what you would do is you would kind of look at other things as well as the photographic image or the film, uh, the film image to substantiate the claim that you're making. Mm -hmm. And though sometimes, I mean, in photojournalism, for instance, that might have been a photographer would have gone out into the field with a writer um, and there would have been, um, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I'm looking at um, right now is contact sheets, which obviously 
reveal a sequence in time. Mm. Um, so you have the before images and the after images that were selected from. Um, yeah. you, you're privy to those that kind of information. So you have, um, with an image sequence, you have more of a kind of conviction in saying that something is more or less unfolded mm. in a way that you can substantiate from being there in the event oh, as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. obviously in most um, situations where we see images now, you, you're provided with a singular image. Mm. And the singular image is kind of maybe backed up with some text and it's kind of provided this way of sort of... Um, uh, quite often provides this kind of convincing way and material most people kind of think you know this provides absolute in, you know evidence yep. for something Absolutely. so nick how have you found that this kind of thinking is important for the kind of training healthcare training context we're using 360 video in um well 360 by its very nature it, it loses the idea of the frame mm. so as the filmmaker you have to depart from the, the the environment you know there is no there is no place for you to be behind the camera because there is no behind of the camera and so that kind of departing if you like of uh, of maker from the apparatus is, is quite an interesting thing to, to look at because you lose that i guess that kind of control of the frame but it, it, it's that agency i guess which i think is, is is really interesting because if the user thinks they have the freedom to explore that scene and therefore they think they they have the, the, the freedom to, f to discover their own narrative and reflect on their own narrative because of that, you know, breaking away from the frame, I guess. Actually, how does that, how does that play out as something which isn't you know, evidence-based? Mm. Because, as Jackie was saying there, you have the, the time between the frames, I guess, or there was, there's elements which aren't covered, which are left for interpretation, or they're not. But what happens when 360 is, is supposedly capturing everything you know mm. the very essence of 360 is the fact that there is no angle uncovered mm. so uh, for me you know is it are we using it in the right way so we're using 360 to capture evidence of an event mm. that's effective to a certain degree but is it actually effective in educating do we mm. want to do we want to replay 360 as just an evidence base no i don't think that i don't think that's where the learning occurs actually i think the most powerful learning of 360 um, happens when we know there are trigger events within that within that filmic interface, okay? So I'm gonna break it down. So what you say makes perfect, is, is totally true, this idea of concealing and revealing. But the focus there is on the framed image, there is a, there is a beginning and an end and, and elements that you perhaps won't see which are up for in, interpretation. And the concealing is sometimes what the frame doesn't capture and sometimes what the frame captures outside of context. What, I, what I'm interested in is actually is that idea in 360 because 360 by its very nature captures everything. You know, there is no, mm -hmm. There's no place where you mm. can hide me as a filmmaker. I become departed from the apparatus because I can't be behind the camera. Mm. There's no such thing as mm -hmm. being behind the 360 camera. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's harder to manipulate the image, the the kind of the time in time and space. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess so. And so, uh, the natural instinct is you place a 360 camera in an environment, you film something as it happens, mm. and then you look back at it, and then there's a there is a piece of you know you've evidenced yeah. The, yeah. the event, I guess. And I see that, you see that in, in journalism, you see the 360 camera being used, um, you know, on, on a kind of a war-torn mm. country, for instance, and you look back at it and there's, there's compassion, there's empathy created because you're, you're, you're virtually transported to that, to that arena and you get, you get a feeling of what it, what it looks like mm. and you see the stories playing out. So I know video plays as an evidence base, but I'm, I'm really interested in actually, especially when you're, when you're using the camera from a patient point of view or a person point of view, which is my, my work, is actually evidence based for me is kind of has, has a limiting learning factor to it and there's something actually about putting the triggers uh, in where you know the viewer as, as they're looking through it you know there are points there which have uh, learning yeah. around it but you're putting those triggers in as subtly so it feels like it's part of the sequence yeah. but it isn't a, a kind of a staged kind of aspect if you like yeah so the the the, the learning comes not from a editor or a filmmaker kind of manufacturing that learning it comes from the person being inside having that change happen inside of them yeah no i, I think i think i think you're right there and that there's something very worrying to me where imagery video included in healthcare is used just as, as an evidence base mm. medical imagery is an evidence base in the sense that relying on you know medical imagery x-ray mri 
has a value there because obviously it's part of the diagnosis process but actually to understand the importance of narratives in this space of backstory and, and elements like that it doesn't necessarily need to take an evidence-based approach to the mm. image if you know what I mean there's an exploration that needs to occur where you are looking at um, storytelling conventions which are somehow incorporated within that you know within those with those films particularly 360 but actually what I'm saying is it has to it, there has to be an element of, of reflection that occurs within that because learning through reflection is obviously really really important mm. it and almost it, sounds like the difference between theater and cinema mm. yeah that you are setting the stage in the mise-en-scene and you're asking the viewer to mm. look for those cues and those props rather Absolutely. than the camera person pointing the camera explicitly at something and saying here it is and this is what I want you to look at yeah so mm. it's it is a very different approach and then what happens when someone is invested mm. in, in searching and seeking mm. those kind of answers or um, problems mm. in, in in this kind of stage of Absolutely. whatever it is then they yeah. they kind of they're more likely to retrieve that to recall that to yeah. you know it's sort of access in the monitor as uh, well and, and that's that's been the conversation for a couple of years now is actually the link between 360 i suppose and theater as opposed to traditional mm. film however there are values of what is really interesting is intersection of actually what what film theory introduces and this idea that the user when it's played out correctly aren't the agents of their own kind of uh, attention if you like so if you think of the conjurer who does the sleight of hand and you know that it's not necessarily magic but because he's a you know, distracted mm. you mm. efficiently. He's you put don't you know. in a passive place. Yeah. Because and um, the sleight of hand only works because he knows there's gaps in your attention mm. and your Absolutely awareness. Absolutely right. And when the when mm. those gaps, sort of, are, yeah. are, you know, that's where he makes his move. But he yeah. he knows where to look for those. He knows where to put the cues. He knows. But there must be, there, there is a way to translate that idea of gaps into three hundred and sixty video. So although the filmmaker mm. isn't necessarily present behind the camera. Mm -hmm. they have an idea of the creation of those environments mm -hmm. and where to place the gaps, those, mm -hmm. all those effective triggers. So what I'm saying is, I guess, from, from the video the other day, is that 360 video has a, has a far more, uh, a bigger influence than just as an evidence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so video and imagery used as an evidence, of course they are. It's not dismissing that, but actually for learning, there is, there is something else to it. Mm -hmm. This idea of, of reflection and this idea of um, imagery as something else is really, really fascinating. So thank you, Nick, for clarifying that theory for us. And thank you to Jackie for joining in on the conversation. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you want to see more. And if you're really keen on these videos, share them around to anyone that you think might be interested in them as well.